Our guest is a modern media entrepreneur who made a name for himself in the Middle East by founding Augustus Media, an award-winning publisher with a popular brand such as Love in Dubai, Love in Saudi, Smashy TV. His dedication to building his business from scratch into a successful enterprise that now employs over 70 people uh, across multiple countries speaks volume about his leadership and ability as an entrepreneur. Welcome. Good morning, guys. It's just beyond. Yeah. <laughs> Nice to be back here. We yeah. chatted a couple of years ago, so it's nice to see what you guys are doing and to be back again. Yeah, a lot has changed for you and for, for, for us as well. I think uh, you guys have, have uh, moved into a new space recently that we were just talking about as well that looks super cool Yeah, in Production City. Yeah, so much has changed. I think it's just the nature of the industry that we're all in and the region that we're in. It's just nothing standing still. <laughs> 100%. 100%. Tell us, tell us a little bit about your journey. I think, you know, with, with the audience that we have, it's always nice to kind of reflect a little bit back of when, when it all started and, and, and what kind of got you on the path of starting Augustus Media. Yeah, so it started in 2015. Uh, I was kind of what looks like at the end of a traditional sort of agency career, you know, did by 10 years. <laughs> sort of, uh, you know, and uh, always wanted to kind of set something up and this is what I set up. You know, there's many different reasons why you kind of set something up or how it looks like. I think um, at the start, it was Love in Dubai in September of that year. And, uh, you know, the mission, we wrote down the mission uh, to become the modern media company of choice in the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, we wrote down the values. And, like, everything has, every big decision or small decision has been related to that since. Oh, nice. And media keeps changing, but, you know, it's, you keep trying to sort of achieve that, you know, so, you know, for example, we don't do talent management, we don't do events. Why? Because it's not that, right? It's not digital, it's not this region, and it's not our own IP. We don't do agency work. We don't, you know, we literally try and chase that. And then, but that's really hard. And actually, uh, why is it hard? Because media itself as an industry and as a business has been disrupted. It's been yeah. disrupted by the tech platforms. It's been disrupted by uh, previous mediums not being as popular, such as TV, such as print and it's been disrupted now by the creator economy so it makes the previous mission even harder and if something's really hard you need to stick to it because if you don't stick to it and it's hard then how are you going to do it so you know um you know we we could just have stuck to love in dubai we could just stick to social media yeah but we keep on trying to add podcasts add streaming add offices across the region um, you know, everything. We have, we have an in-house uh, legal counsel. We've got IP registered in all the markets. We've, nice. you know, all, all this sort of stuff, all this train tracks, all this fundamental infrastructure stuff, all this operations uh, isn't sort of, isn't sort of to maximize profits on love in Dubai and have a lifestyle business in the UAE. It's how to, how to achieve that mission, basically. Beautiful. I must confess, I think, you know, me and many other people as well, we, we get our news from Love in Dubai. I think when you guys post something, we're like, okay, it's happening. <laughs> you know, and I, I think with, when it comes to that sort of change in the way that people are consuming content, it, it's evident that, you know, sh sort of short form and, 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 and I guess digital friendly as well type of, of content is, is, uh, is key. But also you guys, it's clear when you post something because you've got your own style with the content as well, which, yeah. which is coming through. So that sort of um, the, the brand around your content is clear, which, yeah. is, which is nice to see. Uh, when it comes to creating sort of your own IP with content, can you tell us a little bit more about your ambition there? Because you've got a you've got a big team of content creators, studios. What's you know are you is is the ambition here to kind of have series of of different shows and 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 you know podcasts and live streams that you create? I mean, and what I'm thinking now is like uh, Vice, for example, and, and the way Vice was you know was creating content. Is this something that you guys are are heading towards? Is one of the ambitions or? Yeah, and it's a question. Like, it's interesting. But I should go and choose some difficulty at the moment. Yeah, they're a, a 1994 Montreal type magazine. I think uh, media has changed, right? And the you know content and distribution. Um, Vice had a certain lens on the world, a certain outlook. Uh, so you start with that. You start and when you're IP, you start with what's your outlook. Uh, Augustus Media doesn't have a media lens. That has isn't an editorial, right? So. We have brands underneath them, and we call them mindset brands. Uh, traditionally, publishing houses might have verticals. Like, if, if you're Condé Nast or if you're Hearst, you might have an automotive magazine or a beauty magazine or a, or whatever. Uh, we we make conscious decisions around that. So with Lovin', the, the mindset is loving your life. It's YOLO. I kind of joke in the office. It's 
you know, it's for people who watch Friends in the evening and stuff like that, right? <laughs> Which is fine. I think we all do a bit. Like, this is the thing. Humans can be both, can be different. Yeah. But I think for media brands and any any FMC, any brand, it's important to know what you stand for. Uh, and it's important that it's that the audience knows what you stand for. So loving is that love in your life. But it is local news and lifestyle. It captures what's happening in the city. We We keep it as a horizontal. Dubai is the horizontal in terms of what things can fit on it. We don't do love and food. We don't do love and sports. We don't do love and beauty. Yeah. Never dilute that. And that's conscious, mm-hmm. right? Like we, you know, and once we have that tagline and that brand, then we, you know, and many people can say, oh, you're like time out, you do food. Well, actually, we never were in, in, in someone's perspective, but like it's always that sort of horizontal. It can do traffic. It can do community stories. It can do different things. And that's what local news used to do in a community before. Yeah. yeah. And social media is all about community, right? Yeah. We other we have other things, other kind of mini rules. We say we do comp we do communities, not companies, right? Like we literally talk about people and uh in terms of our editorial. So that that's kind of that's sort of one part of it. But to your point, um, you know, uh, yes and no, uh on on vice and other scripted content. You know, again, uh we say w- to be a uh, fast social news and to be someone something that someone is dependable on, you kind of have to have the organization structured around that in terms of when people are available, approval process, speed, and all that sort of stuff. So we we say right now, and we're kind of eight years in, we say we're a non-scripted company. Now that could lead to documentaries, but that's really, you know, when people come in in the morning, at seven in the morning, they're seeing what were people in Dubai, what's happening each other last night about, right? They're not worrying, they're not thinking about what, it's the script for my next episodes, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's a different frame of mind than if the whole company is geared towards that. So then we, we knew we were doing that consciously and we were like, okay, what are the synergies? Let's create another IP. Okay, if we create another IP, what doesn't fit on Lovin'? Okay, fine. 70, 80% of our content of the press releases we get don't fit on Lovin'. They're business, they're yeah. different company stories. Okay, let's create a platform that fits that. Okay, but it might be all boring. It might be upload a web press release onto a website. Okay. Let's make that visual and social. Mm. Okay, that's where Smashy came from. The opposite mindset to loving Smashy, our mindset is for the driven dreamers, doers. So it's on the thesis that there's a young cohort in the region that want economic prosperity, and it's for the whole region. And then again, what's the opposite to loving? Loving's horizontal, with Smashy went for verticals Smashy Entertainment, Smashy yeah. Gaming, Smashy Crypto, right? And we're trying to build communities a bit further down the line there, but that's the brand, that's the identity. How does the word Bloomberg stand for something? Mm. How does it stand for something? When when I see Bloomberg pursuits on Instagram, I know that that's kind of a mindset of a business traveler. But yeah. neither of those two words say business traveler. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why? Why does if someone's surname be yeah. business? Why? Right? If it's a term, you know what I mean. So I think you know it's nineteen eighties New York, like right? Yeah. But like I think I think that's the power of brand over a long time. And that's that that's subjective, and you can only achieve that if you're really disciplined and straight to it. On it. Uh, but uh, to, you know, t- interesting about how media evolves. Like I remember seeing a documentary about Nickelodeon. Okay, fascinating documentary. But for the first ten years, they only did uh, live, non-scripted things. They did things at Universal Studios, and uh, they had shows kind of where they had you know young sort of up and coming entertainers like. Um, not the Disney stuff that Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears were on, but that type of stuff, right? So people were uh, breaking things uh, on the set and there was game shows that was all shot live. Yeah. Cheapest production, you know, it's what they could afford at the time. And they did it for many, many years. And then, you know, once they started generating revenue, they had more talent. They then started making sitcoms and sort of kids programming uh, with actors and like 10 episodes, right? And it was only their third phase that the animation came in with the Rugrats and all this stuff. Yeah. But that was the third phase of a 20, 30 year story, right? Mightn't have all the dates right, but that's the kind of trajectory. And I think like, yes, there is an aspiration there to do different programming in the future. Like with Smashy TV, we're now doing live sports, right? We have the rights to for the futsal volleyball and handball in the UAE. And we do the production as well with AI camera in the 12 stadiums across the UAE, yes. indoor courts. And then we'll add basketball and then we'll try and do paddle and then we'll try and do esports. Yeah. And we have subscription behind that. And it's taken a while, but like, you know, but okay, so is that enough? You know, um, if you you know, if you're watching a sports team, like 
basketball or football or whatever, how often do you watch? It's a two hour a week or twice a week, right? Yeah. So what fills the programming beyond that? How did ESPN go from beyond that, right? They set up business sports center, they set up sports center, and they also had yoga on in the morning, right? So, so a different sort of cable and linear TV was a different era again, yeah. but there's different things going on there. So definitely on, on that side of things. But then also, you know, talking about loving and I think it, with content creators now, especially with the live news and the fast social news yep. that we do, uh, there's a different style of a content creator. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a content creator that I was listening to a podcast uh, about a young girl in the US. She started she, when she's 18, I think she's four years into it. And she made a million dollars in revenue from, from mid-roll on Snapchat. So not even Spotlight, not even the Discover section. She does one to 200 stories a day. Wow. Up to 60 seconds. Wow. Right? All the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah which, which people do. But like, that's a certain style. Then yeah. you have someone like Mr. Beast, which is, who's the Best. flavor of the month at the yeah. moment. And people are like, he hasn't dropped a video in a while. Yeah. He needs to beat his last one. He needs to buy an island. And it's kind of like, yeah. and then it's a drop. Yeah. It's all about the drop. Right. And like, so I, I think the drop part of it is scripted. It's kind of like, you need to design it differently. Yeah. Like this podcast. Exactly. Right? We have time to chat before it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you're kind of like, you'll do a t you'll do an announcement, you do a trailer, that type of thing. That's a different style, right? Yeah. It's semi it's it's non scripted, but it's it's yeah. kind of it's designed in a different way. Yeah. yeah. Just um going back to, to Loving for a second, that it's really interesting the approach with Loving versus Smashing, you're talking about verticals. Now on Loving you use the word local news and I'm getting flashbacks to, to when I was a kid and it was super, super important when you, you know, when you were young, that was the community announcements, right? Now with those communities, how does your approach to creating content, to editorial, to engaging with, with the communities on the platforms, how does that change based on the different cities or the different countries? Yeah, it's a really good question. It, the honest answer is that uh, it's test and learn like okay. we're not sure like we have our we have our guidelines we have our template we yeah. have things that we think work uh you know there's a crown prince in uae there's a crown prince in saudi like there's nostalgia there's brands that people who knew that they're growing up and and things and buildings and places they went to at kids there's sweets they used to eat in all different countries it's all different but if you wrote about that in Liverpool or where did you grow up? Lebanon. Le oh, here, actually. I grew yeah. up here. Um, I'm Lebanon. 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 <laughs> but like, exactly. So, you know, we could, we, we can use the same tactics, the same playbook yeah. to appeal in that way. So some of that works, but then it's test and learn. Like, you know, it, there's different reasons why Lebanon works better in English uh, than it does in Arabic uh, to do with the translation and the, the sure capital letters. But it, even in the language is just different, yeah. right? Like there's cultural stuff, there's things like that. But you know, we did love in Saudi uh, Bil Arabi for like we've done it for six years, and it works to a degree. But uh, but it's for the whole country right now. Love in Riyadh is going a lot faster than love in Saudi. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, so why do you think that is? Sometimes it's down to the creator executing. Uh, you know, it's how how do you scale a creator business, right? And in a sense. You know, loving, you, you know, I, I was the sort of editor and content creator at the start, right? And I always wanted to add more people. It's like, how, how do you get everyone to sort of think like you and package yeah. like you and things like that? Yeah. And you can, and you can, you can write rules, but then the rules change because the platforms change, you know, and uh, the rules change all the time. And there's, there's styles on Instagram now that weren't there. Like there's a, there's a style that's, um, like the wealth as wealth account on Instagram, there's a few of those that are copy that, right? Four or five years ago, that style was just motivational content. Yeah. Now it's global hype stories. Yes. News, right? So but 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 that has that will have a time frame. Yeah. And you know, so there's different styles, but you know, we we but we um we're kind of there is a there is also on the local side, there's algorithms that help local. Like, um they don't, don't really admit it, but like you do you do see more posts from your friends who live in Dubai than you do in, of course, you know, and, and there's things like that that sort of help it. Like, um, and I, you know, whenever a country we go to, people kind of, market entry in business is hard, but in terms of adapting Lovin, Lovin isn't a franchise. It, 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 you know, it was, it was supposed to be, but it's not because 
a franchise usually you, you tell someone the size of straw you can use yeah and you did you know it has to be the same yeah whereas love it you have to have a flavor to it like in pakistan you know we had the love in dubai cruise for years here on a hundred million y- yash right we're not going to have that in pakistan oh, yeah right none of the cities were on, on the coast but like you're not going to do that anyway right like they might have a, a food truck or they might yeah. have a different, you know, in, we're in Khartoum now in Saddam, like music's important there, yes. right? So how do you do that yeah. there? Like, and and and, there, and there's different things. There's different things to connect to an audience and then there's also business things that need to change. But um, but no, but like, I think uh, it's a little bit frustrating in a way, but if we go back to, because uh, you can't scale it so, so fast and it's unpredictable, but if you go b- back to the point of uh, the utility of local news and, um, and, and, thinking that that's something that people will uh will need then if you can produce it in a way of uh how they consume their content in that day then then, then you can get it right i mean ultimately you provide them value to to, to each audience in a different way right yeah so that's really interesting with with loving and obviously there's the the very localized community aspect so then you talked about smashy and that's verticals so you're talking to a broader audience. How do you, or do you see that audience engage in a different way with the brand and with each other because it's regional? And and how does that compare to to the engagement and the conversations that happen on the the Loven platforms? That was that is one reason why the Loven platforms engagement is higher. But there are other reasons. Uh, Smash content is a bit more niche. Yeah, it is the sort of B two B press releases that aren't supposed to get engaged with right but the other thing is we made a lot of mistakes on smashy like we we, we thought we could do a sort of a linear 24-hour streaming service that's got news on all the time and uh we had to pull that back like you know it's about podcasting it's there is streaming elements but like there's a lot of things that that are at play we keep changing the social media strategy testing learning adapting different things uh what goes on verticals and different things and you know, a lot of the team in Egypt do, does this content and uh, it's, you know, this remote work stuff, it's great, but like, how do you really craft something and how do you really get it? We've had great engagement on Snapchat Discover section on Smart She. Uh, we have huge shows in Saudi Arabia, all in Arab. We've got eight shows on Snapchat, four minute episodes. Huge, huge, huge revenue driver, huge numbers, really ta- tailored out of a Riyadh office by young Saudi presenters. Works amazing, right? Works really well, but uh, but it's it's on one platform yeah. and it's not replicated. You know, those people aren't going on to the Smashy app and downloading it. You know, up up until we bought a company called Camp Plus Sport last year, uh, and that's how we got the rights for the uh, sports for the local sports. Up until then, after three years, we had less than like we had less than ten subscribers on Smashy, right? Why? Well, most of the content, all the content was free on YouTube anyway. Yeah. So there's nothing of value behind the paywall. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was this sort of, should it be a free app supported streaming services? Should it be SVOD? Should it be AVOD? And all this sort of stuff. But, um, you know, we're persisting with it because we, we believe kind of in streaming and things like that. Like I did a talk at the NAS Summit at the weekend and literally tried to describe where people are consuming media now. Yeah. Streaming uh podcasts newsletters and vertical video or social all four things and like i you know that's that's the equivalent of radio tv newspaper of the past you know in a way and people will kind of deny it but actually like let's be honest right like <laughs> interesting you know and and uh you know I, I was listening to a podcast and they were promoting another thing that launched and they said the founder launched something called the week and now he's launched something called the knowledge and only at the end of the like five minute promo did they say that the week was a magazine and the knowledge is a newsletter, you know, and everything in the US in the last few years that's launched is a newsletter. Puck, Axios, Semaphore, Morning Brew, like they're all newsletters. Yeah, they have a they have a read more onto a website. But like when I said those four things, I didn't say websites. Yeah. Like, OK, there are some news apps, but like websites aren't like. People are not visiting websites for, for, for that kind of content, yeah. No. Interesting. You mentioned something really cool at, at the start is, I mean, two things, the creator economy and how that's disrupting uh, the way that we kind of consume media in general at the, today. And I feel like your structure with the business is closer to that creator economy uh, model in, in a sense. 
what do you think is is the important components to build a community, uh, a true community, and not just kind of like an audience? And I think there's perhaps a small difference when when it comes to that. So as a brand, as a, as a creator, uh, what are the key things that people need to think about while building a community online? I think I think there there are um, best practices for community building, and uh, you know it stems from like what's the job description for a community manager in terms of engagement and you know crisis management and replying back and multiple lightweight engagements. Like that's the that's the one one of social media strategy. Yeah. You know, like bonfires and fireworks. Like keep something on all the time and then give them something exciting. But you have to be there. You know, like you have to have that conversation going all the time. And you have to have that multiple lightweight conversation, uh, loads of interactions, like uh, with a few new people. And like I, I took out the phone, and I was like, "This is what you do." Yeah. Like ev- every DM, every tag you get, you do three things: you like the story, you open up the post, you like the post, and then you comment, and you just do it incessantly. Yeah. And that you have to do it. And you know, yeah. like um, you know, people will say other things, but like you have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> just and not everyone does it, you know, but um. But like I, th- I think uh, you know that, that that's community. But like you know, I think the word community is kind of overplayed a bit. Like if brands say they have to grow a community, fine. But like at the end of the day, they're customers, and there's a value exchange there. You know, I don't think um, you know th- there are some examples of people doing everything because they absolutely love something. Yeah. Like uh, football fans are. Uh, you know, fans of celebrities and things like that. There are armies and there are things like that. And I get that. But maybe like, but maybe those people didn't cultivate it. Maybe it's the value that they provide. But if you go back to the Taylor Swift story, like she did all that interaction to generate a community and things like that. But, you know, I, I yeah, love and community aspect is important. But uh, as you said, Matthew, like if we're providing a value, if we're, if we're doing the content uh, and we think that we're giving something in a way that people aren't receiving it in other ways, you know, like there, you know, I remember during the pandemic, there was, even though websites have dropped off, there was 3 million people reading our website every month, uh, just because we were the only ones providing it in English. Like we were, when the, uh, when the state broadcasts were being done about the pandemic in Arabic, we were real time voiceover translating that live, you know, and a lot of sort of stuff. And it was like, we had a media missions permit, like it was literally provide local news right yes. there's a vocation there's a, a utility there and i think uh so that's the product and you know it's we're not necessarily just a community like there are things that are community that there's no give and take that there's no sell right like that there's no other value i think first and foremost we're a product uh it's local news a little bit light entertainment and some escapism and then there's the aspect of community building which definitely is closer to our product than sure mics or whatever yeah um uh that but um you know it's definitely closer to that but they can still have it uh they can follow best practice community guidelines yeah you um you've mentioned something that i love a few times you've openly talked about mistakes and you've you've used the the phrase test and learn quite a few times and it's something that we've talked about quite a lot at the agency as well it comes across that there's a quite an open environment for people to make mistakes just from this conversation. How do you cultivate that um, safety within the organization so that people can come with ideas that may not work and are not, there's, there's no sense of worry or, or fear when they're doing that or when something, you know, doesn't go as planned? I, th- I think there could be still worry and fear. I think, you know, like we can all fear mistakes and failure, you know, and I think we can try and encourage it. Yeah. Like I make mistakes openly and, uh and you know there's all that as well like in our values uh so there's tenacity which is about kind of never giving up and then there's uh velocity about momentum and getting projects going things like that and ingenuity is that bit of genius in all of us and the ingenuity value is that part of like empowerment and just sort of look uh i i have a brain i can figure something out i'm just going to go do it and sometimes some people react well to that sometimes it's kind of sink or swim and like you know that type of thing but um we're an independent company we're under you know other than sort of media guidelines and real world pressures there's no this we don't add internal pressures yeah. on mistakes like we're all adults like we all have responsibility and things like that um so and we all have other pressures but i think uh you know you get the best results if you have you know you guys are a couple hundred people if we have, if we have 70 people 
and we we're really empowering them to actually watch and see and and improve then you get better results yeah. so and yeah the, the you know mistakes what are mistakes you know like i, I love mistakes because it gets on um, social media it gets more engagement i shouldn't say them <laughs> like, I, I shouldn't admit that on camera but like no but it's that point it's like you know social media is so ephemeral it's so sort of transient that like yeah. you know it, it, you see some of the videos i that we used to put up in 2017 and stuff absolute crap you know like, <laughs> it because we couldn't afford this right yeah. now luckily canva and whatever but like you know but it didn't matter and people yeah. people would be so precious on their brand that they wouldn't put something out we don't have that you know and like the there's things that i don't like going up and i i point them out but i want to i want to cultivate a culture of like let's point everything out and let's fix it the next time really really fast all the time yeah. uh, and it suits our it suits our business like i think with brands you have less leeway there if you're working on clients and things like that and um but like you know so say if you have clients and you make mistakes there's screenshots there's whatsapp there's emails there's you know you might lose the retainer you might whatever but we have that same thing except it's at government level where if we make a mistake we're getting calls and etc cetera, etc cetera. so we have we have the ultimate pressure yeah. it's not like oh i might lose a retainer it's like well you might lose the company yeah you know like all the people that we employ who have kids yeah. right like if i if our business doesn't if i make a big mistake then i'm i i can't the, the business can't provide for all that you know yeah. and that's pressure <laughs> sure 100 percent. i think you know with the way that AI is playing a role at the moment in the industry and with content as well. I think one question that I had in mind is, you know, sooner we already see like, you know, uh, very professional deep fakes and, and things where Obama's like introducing our common friend, uh, John Senai, for example, he posted something like, that. <laughs> where is this true? Like, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, with, with that kind of getting better and better, and this is just at the infant stage right now, how do you feel, especially with the news section, how do you feel the authenticity of news with AI playing a role that, you know, things could really sort of take a you know a wrong turn so how, how do you think the audience is going to respond to um authenticating content and and use specific yeah i think you know a news person could take the higher ground here and say that you know it, it's it's even more important now that there's a high paid journalist to tell the truth and etc because everything's fake right like but that's kind of getting away from the fact that they need to embrace ai yeah right they need to embrace this technology there was a conference in the US recently, a media one, and a guy called Barry Diller spoke at it. He worked under Fox over the years. He's kind of famous for The Simpsons as his thing, right? Like he made that really, really big. Mm. And uh, he was asked on stage, like, because he runs another group now that has loads of, I forget the websites, I think it's that Expedia or CNET or one of these, but he basically they publish a lot of articles. Yeah. And he was like, are you going to use, um, are you going to use AI? And he's like, no, we're not going to use AI at all uh, because everyone's rushing into it. And everyone rushed into paywalls 15 years ago uh, and it was a mistake. Or No, everyone rushed into not having paywalls 15 years ago and it was a mistake. Yeah. So uh, that's his view. Uh, he might be right, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't think... <laughs> uh, no, I, look, it's an approach and I think you have to have a, a stance for your business. Like if if that works and they have value and they and they can call out a, a a fake a deep fake and everything and they can provide value that's fine but you know i don't i don't necessarily ai again is this sort of if there's palpable excitement around ai at the moment in terms of investing and everyone's pivoting uh we take a more sober approach to it where it's like this is just another technology right like going back to video and editing say there's 30 out of 70 people in our company who create content on a daily basis, like the biggest of the four departments. Uh, only one of them is a kind of a trained videographer. Okay, maybe like three or actually a bit more, but but like uh, not all of them, yet all of them make video. Yeah. Why? Because it's Canva, because yeah. we have templates yeah. and they all produce video. And it's similar with AI. Yeah. They're all going to use AI. But like, but for me, the leap is as exciting. Like if, if you're going to create video without knowing how to edit or not knowing how to shoot, that's as big a jump about generating an image or prompting something to get something back. Yeah. Like this, yeah, AI can be more powerful, but at the base generative part, it's not actually, it's not actually, it's exciting, but so was being able to do video without, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So 
I think um, I think from our point of view, uh, I, we will embrace it. Uh, we already are, and we have a process around it, and we pay for the right licenses, mm -hmm. whether it's ChatGPT, OpenAI, or whether it's Midjourney, or whether it's whatever, it will pay for the right licenses, and it will just be another software technology that goes under a budget software cost, and everyone will be trained on it, mm -hmm. and we'll produce more content. Uh, I like it because we're in 16 cities now at Lovin, and we want to be more across the region. I like the idea of doing more AI. We have, there's, um, say, this podcast, there's a yeah. software called Munch, you put this episode into Munch, in 10 minutes, it'll give you 10 video, between seven and 13 videos back, and it'll have the captions, yeah, yeah. right? So it's a pump and dump game, yeah. and like people can kind of decide whether to do that, um, you know, and then what does that do for your TikTok strategy, your vertical video strategy, your YouTube shorts, and there's more and more in that, but like, you know, at the same, you could ask the same question, well, you know, does that mean that everything's gonna explode in content? Yeah. It might, but then, you know, does that mean that everything's going to be fake, etc., you know? But, um, yeah, we could debate the, in theory about the, the risks of AI. I think the bigger question is the stuff that Elon Musk talks about and the relationship between humans and sure. our yeah. ability. Yeah, yeah they, I think, that, I think that's, that's more worrying about the fake news question. Yeah, yeah. I agreed. What's been uh, one of the most important advice that you've received starting your business for you know, other entrepreneurs that are starting their journey right now, what do you think is a fundamental sort of truth that you have lived by? Yeah, years? I saw that question in the prep and I really tried to think <laughs> about a simple answer, but it's a tough one. Like, you know, dear, like when, when I was starting the business, I remember I had a little bit of doubt and I rang one, an old boss kind of friend and we had a chat and he goes, you'd be great, just do it. You know, and I think, I think, I think sometimes you just need encouragement. Yeah. You know, it's like when people come to you, like people come to me and say, I should be doing a podcast about your start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think I, I think that that's that's the advice is just kind of do it, believe in it, and things like that. Uh, but it, but you know, if I was giving advice, I'd say it's a business. So like, you know, you have to run it as a business. Like, not it's not about glamour. You have to do it for the right reasons. It's not, like all this sort of funding and VC money and all this idea of like exiting quick and all this sort of stuff. Like that, that's a, some people do set up a business to exit and they execute, but they're really good executioners and they're probably well able, right? But like, I think at its core, if you're setting up a, a consumer business or a digital business or whatever, that there are fundamentals that you need. Like my, my dad had an insurance business, my mom had restaurants and, you know, I saw the mistakes say on the restaurant side that one would make, you know, and, uh, how and and the advice and back is like run it better. Yeah, you know, like yeah. we, we people say we, they talk about Buzzfeed and and Vice. Like Buzzfeed are making three, four, five hundred million dollars this year in revenue. We're doing seven, right? Yet we're more profitable than them. Oh wow! wow. How? Yeah, because they're not run well. Loss making after ten, twelve years, like it, it becomes difficult, you yeah. know. And we're going to have pitfalls. Like we're growing at like sixty percent last year. We're growing forty percent this year. That's not sustainable. Sure. Like if you look at the history of the companies, uh, that's not sustainable. So I have to sort of, you know, dampen the expectations and kind of slow it down a bit and things like that. Um, and you know, we talked about loving and smashy, right? Like, uh, you know, I would love to do add more influencer brands under Augusta Media portfolio, but I haven't finished. I haven't even achieved what we need to with this. So the focus, like needs to be on those things yeah you know yeah. and yeah I, I think like from that level like i'm you know i can give advice or can talk about what we need to do but the exciting the nice thing about a business is when it's working you know what buttons to push that generate uh that drive your business so if you have a restaurant business and you know what brought people in or you know what food sells, yeah. you just do more of that. Are, are these kinds of yeah. right? new that were And it's about the knowing. I think, you know, a lot of the times, sometimes when businesses are, are, are doing well, it's it's an overall sort of cloud that's kind of like driving a lot of the revenue. Yeah. And I think understanding what are the buttons to, to press is very important. That's so true. Yeah. Like, dude, we talked before about like our studios and do more shows. Like I would love to do more shows, but I don't have the formula that's going to make sure they all land and they all get big audience and they all get revenue. Yeah. But what I do have the formula for is the local news part. Yeah. Like we hired a, a, a girl, she did a TikTok that was kind of a bit negative of love in Dubai a few months ago. And I checked out all her other TikToks and I was like, you're really good. And uh, your style of content, the storytelling, 
it's utility, it's telling people where to go, yeah. where to buy. Yeah. Uh, so we hired her, right? But, but so, but you know, it might work or might not. But like the reason I, I wanted to add that is because I know that that content is it. That's an investment into something that's already working. Yeah. We've um, you've talked about the challenges around growth and rapid growth, which I think we, we've we've felt as well. Um, and we've talked about AI. I guess they're two big challenges at the moment. What are the other big challenges that challenges that you see in the media landscape specifically in this region over the next year or two? Yeah, I think you know the regions, the Gulf especially, the economics of the Gulf are quite good at the moment. Uh, I think Saudi grew at eight point four percent, eight point seven percent last year. And it'll be less than that this year. It'd be like three something this year, but that's quite exciting. Um, UAE is the economy is going well. Uh, so the the regional outlook for media is it's an emerging market. Yeah. The you know if you look at kind of consumer me- media and subscriptions, the affluency to spend isn't as high, um, and there's already a lot of competition. So I don't think that. We, what we'll see is faster growth, like uh, consumption of, say, Netflix has stagnated on subscriptions US, but it's growing very fast here. But but it has a cap, right? Like, you know, I think there's about 12, 15 million people. We haven't seen the post-Ramadan numbers, subscribers of streaming in the region. Uh, but that number isn't at, isn't anywhere near the amount of people who used to watch TV at like 100 million yeah. or whatever. So, yeah. uh, and, you know, to think that we're just going to jump there yeah, yeah. We still need like our office in Egypt. We don't have fibrous network. Like you know, like, yeah. So this this thing, and if if that's in Cairo, what about in the other parts? So I think so. There's this fundamental infrastructure things around digital still in an emerging market, which impacts media. Um, there's other like media as well. You know, I'm quite fortunate and lucky, and by design that we we don't have outside and uh, outside the region investors. We don't have outside the region ownership or anyone to answer to. So we can build our our media lenses around the media guidelines in the region and relation in relation to the culture, in relation to Islam, in relation to uh, things that suit the region. Yeah, which I think is is good, right? Like there's you know people have views on media in other markets and they're often linked to constitutions or they're often linked to cultures and they just want to dictate that onto every region and and I think you know so. You know, on one level, I think it's good that we're focused on this region. On another level, there's still challenges there. Yeah. There's still challenges on, uh, you know, on how do you sort of protect your employees? How do you protect the content that you're doing? How do you tell stories that resonate? Um, how do you provide value and things like that? And then, you know, navigating. Yeah, there's AI, but there's navigating uh, all the different dynamics. You know, th- there's no... There's no simple formula for media. Like, what's the price of, uh, of local news? Like, what's the, what's the you know back at, back in the past, if you bought a newspaper, there was a price for it. Yeah. Or it was, like, there's no simple formula. So that's a big challenge on media, and that's why it's so undervalued. That's why companies are valued at less than one times revenue. That's why no VCs touches media. Um, you know, but at the same time, you know, the excitement is the creator economy. The ability to Web three that we don't really talk about this year, but we did a lot last year. <laughs> yeah. But like Web three, the promise of Web three was to was to uh, was on top of Web two. Web two got your social media audi- audiences and engagement. Web three was supposed to give you value on the back of yeah. that, and I think that that still holds true. I think it'll play out over time. Interesting. Interesting. Richard, thanks a lot for coming on to the podcast. It was Good lovely to be back, guys. Conversation. Thanks, thanks for your time this morning. Cheers, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. And cheers.